Good morning. Thank you. Thanks for coming out this morning. Welcome to the Ethical Humanist Society of Chicago. We have moved into uh, we, a hybrid model. We've been in some hybrid of a hybrid model, and uh, this continues it. Everything's called hybrid now. So we have people here in person and live streaming on YouTube. So appreciate you coming or tuning in, as the case may be. Uh, I want to introduce myself. I'm Rick Gutham, and I've been a member at the Ethical Humanist Society for several years. Um, in addition to being a moderator, we have a rotating moderating core. Uh, I'm on the board. I work on the finance committee, and I help schedule some of these programs as well. I uh, appreciate uh, everyone coming. And um, the people in the room, we appreciate if you keep your mask on during the uh, presentation. Uh, if you're speaking at a microphone, um, as I am taking it off is fine. I think that's going to be more clear. Um, so we'll proceed with that plan um, as we go. Um, something about the Ethical Humanist Society is that we've been here for 140 years and we have uh, a group of people who are committed to uh, ethical enlightened experiences. And I think we have one for you this morning as well. Um, and I wanted to, we have a lot of things, a lot of has been written about humanists and we have a lot of things to pick from. I chose something a little bit different to maybe enlighten what humanism is about this morning. It's not from our usual listing. It's actually described as a poem, which some of you may have heard, although I had never heard it until earlier this year. I think it's very good. It will take me a moment to recite it for you. Um, it's written by a man from Indiana. It was written 100 years ago. His name is Max Ehrman. He uh, was a lawyer his whole life, but uh, became a writer. And he wrote this supposedly when he was in his late 50s, but it's a little questionable. If you want to look it up, you'll see that there's a lot of controversy about when he wrote it um, and why he started to do it. But the poem is called Deserata. Um, it's a Latin word for things to be desired, specifically referring to things to be desired in a person. And so here it goes. Go placidly among the noise and the haste and remember what peace there is in silence. As far as possible, without surrender, be on good terms with all persons. Speak your truth quietly and clearly and listen to others, even to the dull and the ignorant. They too have their story. Avoid loud and aggressive persons. They are vexatious to the spirit. If you compare yourself with others, you may become vain or bitter, for always there will be greater and lesser persons than yourself. Enjoy your achievements as well as your plans. Keep interested in your own career, however humble. It is a real possession in the changing fortunes of time. Exercise caution in your business affairs, for the world is full of trickery. But let this not blind you to what virtue there is. Many persons strive for high ideals, and everywhere life is full of heroism. Be yourself, especially do not feign affection nor be cynical about love. In the face of all aridity and disenchantment, it is as perennial as the grass. Take kindly the counsel of the years, gracefully surrender the things of youth, nurture strength of spirit to shield you in sudden misfortune, but do not distress yourself with dark imaginings. Many fears are born of fatigue and loneliness. Beyond a wholesome discipline. Be gentle with yourself. You are a child of the universe, no less than the trees and the stars. You have a right to be here. And whether or not it is clear to you, no doubt the universe is unfolding as it should. Therefore, be at peace with God, whatever you conceive him to be, and whatever your labors and aspirations in the noisy confusion of life, keep peace in your soul with all its sham, drudgery, and broken dreams it is still a beautiful world. Be cheerful, strive to be happy. Okay, thank you for, that was a lengthy one for us. Um, but I think it uh, speaks to humanism in a nice way. Uh, and so I now have the honor of uh, introducing our speaker. And I wanna let you know that our programs address a variety of topics um, from art and philosophy, history. Today's topic is really about Chicago history uh, photography, uh, art, maybe, and maybe uh, about ethics as well. Um, it, interesting, if you if you pick up the book we'll be talking about, I don't think that's explicitly stated, but I do think that's in there um, today. And so our speaker today is uh, uh, Richard Cahan. Uh, Richard Cahan is the former P 
picture editor for the Chicago Sun-Times. Um, he is the author or co-author or editor of more than a dozen award-winning books, including books about slavery, World War II, and Barack Obama. He co-wrote with Michael Williams, Vivian Meyer, Out of the Shadows, Edgar Miller, and The Handmade Home, and Richard Nickel, Dangerous Years. Uh, to tee up the, the, the book a little bit for you, and I know you're going to go into it in detail, uh, it's a book of uh, photographs by the staffs of the Chicago Sun-Times and the Chicago Daily News. Uh, it includes labor strikes and racial unrest, immigration, crimes and catastrophes, renewal and resistance. This book is about our recent past. It begins at the start of World War II and ends in the calamitous year of 2020. It covers Chicago from uptown to Pilsen, from west, north, to the south side, and it includes the people who help mold modern Chicago. Mayors like the Dailies, Harold Washington, Jane Byrne, and outsiders such as Martin Luther King Jr. and Abby Hoffman. The book is introduced by, has an introduction written by, I should say, uh, the Chicago Sun-Times writer Lee Bay, um, who has been here as well, presenting to us last year and on his prior book, uh, Southern Exposure. Um, the book is um, edited by Richard Cahan, who is here with us this morning, as well as Michael Williams. And so now it's my honor to introduce Richard Cahan. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. It's nice to see people, <laughs> real people. Uh, this is the first speech that I've given. I've done a bunch of Zooms talks uh, in the last two years. Uh, but this is the first time I've actually gotten up and seen a room of people, and I feel the same fear that every speaker, every good speaker feels before they're about to speak. Um, I should add a little bit about my background. Uh, be, uh, I was actually raised in Lincolnwood, about a mile south of here, and uh, I went to school at Niles West, so every morning I would take the bus and we would go right by this site, and uh, I remember when the 7-Eleven, the little convenience stores, now stores, but I think it was a single store, was built, gosh, probably in the 70s sometimes. Uh, I remember when the grill was uh, a Dunkin' Donuts. And I can't imagine, I can't count how many foods they've sold at that little place. Um, and since then, um, I raised my family in Skokie. Um, and now I live in Evanston. So I'm a man of real broad experience. You know, you're, you're really getting a world view from me. But you know, as, as Rick's uh, poem kind of alluded to, um, you can see the world in a day. And, you, and I think we all did yesterday. Uh, we saw the possibilities of summer and the possibilities of uh, uh, life. And I, I hope you, I assume you all feel like I do. I'm kind of kicking and screaming about today's weather and unwilling to, um, to really uh, acknowledge that, that we're back into winter. Um, so this book, I guess, gosh, when did it start? Uh, let's say it started in the 1940s. So as Rick said, it's really our history. As I look out, there's not a lot of young people here, but uh, there are people contemporary of my age. And, and this really was our, these were really our years. Um, I was born in 1953, and I think this book starts around 1940. Um, when there was a newspaper called The Sun, and there was a newspaper called The Times, and there was The Daily News, and there was obviously The Tribune. But uh, this, this, this book focuses on the work by the Chicago Sun photographers, and that was called the Chicago's Picture Newspaper. And The Sun merged with The Times in 1948. So it's based on an archive of photographs that includes those two newspapers and the Chicago Daily News. And that archive is, has had a strange history that I'll talk to you about in a second. But as, as Rick mentioned, I started in 1983, uh, and I worked at Sun-Times until 1999, so 16 years as the paper's, uh, pick, most of those years as the paper's picture editor. And I assume if you're like my mother, you have no idea what a picture editor does. Um, basically, we all know what a copy editor does. We know what an editor, you, you write something and you give it to someone and they spruce it up and it looks much better and you take the credit for it and they silently smile. Uh, a picture editor does the same exact thing, but for pictures, for photographers. 
a photographer will go out in my day, um, photographers were using um, uh, negatives and a photographer would usually take, oh, I'd say three rolls of 36, so about a hundred photographs for most assignments. Um, and they'd bring back long rolls of film and we'd put it on the light table and we'd use a loop and we'd look through the pictures because there really is no time to make prints during those years. You couldn't go back to, and make a hundred prints or, you know, so we looked at the hundred so photographs from the press conference and we tried to find what we thought was the best photograph. And maybe we'd choose two or three and those three, we'd send it back to the dark room and the, um, Boy, such great words, dark room, and uh, I might even throw in the word typewriter one. <laughs> but um, we'd go back to the dark room and we'd make prints, actual prints, uh, eight by 10 prints of these three pictures, and they would write the captions on, I'm glad, and they wrote it on typewriters. And we'd slap the, we'd have glue, little glue guns, and we'd put the captions on the back of the photographs. And that's what we would take to what we called the page one editors. And the page one editors would talk to us and they'd say they like this photograph and we'd explain to them that no in this photograph that you like the person's eyes are closed and you really should pick that photograph and of course the one that they chose was the one that they we ended up using um but it was uh it was really a joyful experience i think the 1980s and the 1990s were i don't know if they were the heyday of newspapers but looking back today they certainly they could be classified as that um they were really interesting years of the sun times because actually the day i was hired in 19, uh, april 20th 1983 uh the sun times announced that they were going to sell the newspaper and uh that was uh there were famous pictures of jim hogue who was the editor of the sun times standing on a desk and announce, making the announcement and we had no idea where the paper what would happen to the paper and a couple of a uh, couple months a couple of years about a couple of months later rupert murdoch bought the paper and we were owned by Murdoch for several years. And for the next many years, we were owned by kind of his associates or people that, that the paper was sold to. Um, and it would be nice to say that uh, I was offended by the sale and I was too good for Rupert Murdoch. And, um, and, but the truth is, is I found that I learned more from Murdoch's editors than I had in journalism school and I had in my first years of papers because they viewed life so differently than I did. Um, and um, they, they, they made me question everything. Uh, as it turns out, I disagreed with most of their philosophy of life and what's important in newspapers, but uh, it gave me a chance to realize what I, it, it, you know, if you work for people, oops, I'm sorry. If you, I now have a relationship now with these my rules. If you work for people of very similar mindset, you end up not learning quite as much as if you work for people who have very different views. And so I, I do value that. And, and I think they really did um, uh, add a lot to my newspaper education. Uh, Chicago on the whole kind of rebelled against Rupert Murdoch and his papers. They all of a sudden called it a tabloid. We were always a tabloid. It came since 1948, we were a tabloid. We were the bright one. But instead of referring to just the size of the paper, they were talking about kind of what the, the philosophy behind the paper was. Um, as someone who was working at the paper, frankly, it was a little more fun. We, we did things that um, uh, were unexpected. I remember uh, a little boy, Jimmy Tantalitz, uh, was uh, pulled out of Lake Michigan and uh, after 20 minutes under the lake, and we called him Frozen Jimmy, it was like being on the New York Post. And um, I'm sure readers thought, oh, this is beneath us, this kind of journalism. Uh, but as somebody who was practicing it, it was kind of fun and different, and I, I don't regret it. Um, I left the paper in 1999 uh, very briefly to, to create and found a, a pretty spectacular project to document what Chicago was like in the year 2000. It was called City 2000 for Chicago in the year 2000. And so here was a whole different way of documenting life through uh, photography. We also, also used audio and visual. But the goal of this project, has anyone ever heard of City 2000? The goal of this project was to create a record of what Chicago was like so that people in the year 3000 could understand what, what we were like. And uh, it was, we literally started January 1st, 2000 and ended December 31st in 2000. 
and we had a staff of six full-time photographers and 200 independent freelance photographers. And uh, well, what we created, I'm, I'm very proud of. It's, uh, it's kind of hidden in an archive at the University of Illinois at Chicago, but if you're around in the year 3000, you'll see it and you'll, it's, it's almost as exciting as time capsules, you know, whenever you reveal, reveal what, what someone has, has put aside so that people in the future can understand us. So I kept a relationship with the Sun-Times uh, during the next uh, 20 years. Um, I wrote books, as Rick mentioned, and my heart was in this, always uh, really very closely associated with the Sun-Times. In 2003 or four, mm -hmm. I did a book based on the Sun-Times archive called Real Chicago. And then the following year, I did a book based on the archive called uh, Real, uh, it was called Real Chicago Sports. And, um, and then uh, I finally was able to, uh, drift away from the Sun-Times. But in a couple of years ago, I would say it was 2018, um, I, I helped save the photo archive of the Sun-Times, and I'll explain that to you. In 2009, the Sun-Times was approached by a man in Little Rock, and he offered to scan, digitally scan, every photograph and every negative in the Sun-Times archive and return those scans with the captions to the Sun-Times so they would be very easily accessible. Until then, they were in, a, in what we called a morgue, and literally you had to go through usually you know, dozens or thousands of photographs to find what you really wanted, and this would all be digitized. And so that was very appealing. And they also offered the Sun-Times almost a million dollars to do that, and that was even more appealing and made the offer almost too good to be true. Well, it was too good to be true because he never finished the process. He went bankrupt. So what he was getting out of it is he was getting the original prints, the million or so original sometimes prints that he would sell on, on eBay. Uh, and he did this, but in the process, he went bankrupt. The millions <clears throat> of negatives that he had scanned and the, um, and, and, the print, and the prints that he had scanned got scattered across the country. And um, a, a large part of them ended up in Illinois, and I had heard about this, and my colleague, Michael Williams, who was really instrumental in this whole process, connected the uh, Chicago History Museum with the owner of these, uh, of the, of this, of these documents. And amazingly, uh, the Chicago History Museum bought them from him, and even more amazingly, um, the Donnelly Foundation gave them a large grant to start digitizing them. So a lot of this collection is at the Chicago History Museum, and you can see them online at the Chicago History Museum web portal. Um, about two years ago, it was actually the first week after, uh, it was in late March of, you know, these years are starting to get strange on all of us, but it was uh, in March in 2020, because there's COVID-19, and then it's, you know, they should just get rid of the 19 part of COVID, that's it. <laughs> And then there's absolutely no reason to capitalize every letter in COVID. It's not like NASA. It doesn't stand for anything. It should just, just be a capital C. But um, so, so in um, 1919, the Sun-Times opened up a show that was based on this photo archive that I helped curate with Michael Williams. And that was show was called Millions of Memories. Has anyone had a chance to see it? It's, um, it's, 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 a, it's a look at, as I say, the last 80 years. Um, and then since then, we've created this book, uh, Chicago Exposed, which is based on the archive, but not really based on the show, because this gave us a chance to give one last look at the Sun-Times collection. And I think that this book is a much more serious book than the exhibition and uh, our previous books. There's no sports pictures. There's no great celebration pictures. What we really tried to do what was behind the thought of every photograph was that we wanted to find pictures that were taken 40 years ago, but are relevant today, that spoke to who we are now. And um, that was a challenge. Uh, there's a challenge in the way the, sun, the, 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 the diversity of subjects that the Sun-Times did. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, we had a tremendous problem finding pictures of the Hispanic community that literally wasn't taken uh, during the Cinco de Mayo, de Mayo parade. We, we had a rule that we weren't gonna put anyone in sombreros in the book that would represent uh, Latino 
the Latino community. Um, sports was the coverage of African American communities was, I won't say primarily, but very heavily uh, based on sports and violence. Um, we seldom found any photographs of disabled people, which was, you know, a great loss to me. And so, in a sense, we re-edited those pictures. I described to you how we would stand at a light table, if you worked at the Sun-Times, and you'd have about 10 seconds to look at, probably a second to look at every frame, and you'd have to make your decision instantaneously. And then those photographs were just wrapped up and put away. And so we had a chance to relook at the negatives. And I think that's what the real value of this book is. Um, the other value of the book, and I, I was going to talk about the words after the pictures, but I'll, I'll hold off the pictures because there's always an anticipation of waiting for pictures, was we thought that words were as important as the pictures in telling this story. So we had, we reached out to get short essays written about everyone. I think there's 70 or 75 photographs in the book. We have 70 or 75 essays. Uh, and we really wanted these people to add something to the pictures. So the first people that we reached out to, anyone have an idea who would be the most obvious first people to write essays? I'll tell you the answer, and it's so obvious, but you'll never think, you're not thinking of it. The photographers, what a concept. These are the people that actually snapped the shutter and they probably have something to say about each picture. So we literally tracked down as many of the photographers who took these pictures as possible. Uh, we talked to Bob Black, who is a contemporary of mine, who is called the legend when he was working at the Sun-Times. Um, and he talked about a picture that he photographed during the Martin Luther King riots. Uh, he's African-American and he got in his car and he just drove home and stopped at a local church and took a picture of a woman crying. We talked to, to we talked to Dwayne Hall, who is very famous for his photographs from the 1968 Democratic National Convention. Uh, he told a wonderful story about climbing a light pole downtown in the middle of the riots, the police riots, and looking down as police uh, whipped their billy clubs around. And they saw him up there, but he said he was an old, he was a young man. He was a he was a boy from North Carolina who knew how to climb better than any policeman could climb. And so he waited up there for over an hour and finally came down when it was all over. Uh, we talked to Jack Dykinga, who lives in Arizona, and he talked about an incredible series of photographs he took of developmental residential communities for mentally, uh, uh, for people who have developmental problems. And he took downstate and he remembers those days very well in his his wife, he told me, was a nurse, and she couldn't get over the pictures that, that she saw and how, how it affected him. Uh, we talked to Jim Frost, who photographed the Mirage. Does anyone know about the Mirage series? Uh, the Sun-Times wanted to document uh, payoffs in Chicago. And that's a subject that's awfully hard to document. You can't go up to somebody, some alderman, and say, do you get paid off or, you, or some fire inspector? So they set up a bar called the Mirage, what a wonderful name for that. And uh, Jim Frost and Gene Pisick were photographers and they were up in the second floor room and Pam Zeckman was a young reporter. You probably heard of her and say Smith. And they ran the bar for about three months and they literally documented fire inspectors coming in for payoffs and uh, everything they saw, they wrote about and they photographed. Um, interestingly, it was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize and Ben Bradley, the, the great Washington Post editor, rejected considering it because he thought it was entrapment, which how else do you document payoff, payoffs? Uh, we talked to Richard Dirk, who photographed John Wayne Gacy on the day he was arrested. And I talked to Kevin Horan, who was a photographer who was flying in a plane over flight 191 and got there and he thought he would have the best, absolute, the best vantage point of what had happened. But by the time the helicopter I mean, there was, it was just tiny little debris. There was really, really very little to see. So that was our first group that we talked to. And then we tried to talk to the subjects of pictures. Uh, we, we have a picture of uh, two little children uh, at a bonfire protesting busing in the 1960s or 70s, I think late 60s. And um, they had a very unusual name. And I found 
the name of their father in California and talk to him about busing. And it was it was really interesting because we we today portray people who are opposed to busing as so uh, intellectually bankrupt. It's an easy way to you know portray it, portray it. But he said he just wanted his kids to go to school in their neighborhood and community. And so I thought you know talking to the subjects of pictures were were invaluable. Uh, we talked to lots of people who were there. We talked to Bobby Rush about Fred Hampton. Uh, Bobby Rush said that he thinks about Fred Hampton every day of his life, and he wonders what would have happened to him had he not been assassinated in 1969. We talked to a man who witnessed the 1977 L crash downtown at State and, let's see, Wabash and Lake Street, and how he watched the train come down right next to him. Uh, we talked to the attorney of Gary Dotson. I remember Gary Dotson. He was... Uh, uh, accused of rape. He was one of the first people that was uh, exonerated because uh, of De the woman who accused him of rape um, um, recanted. And uh, there was a big, it was a, a very big news event in the 1980s. Uh, we talked to a woman who led the Willis wagon marches, the wagons that were attached to Chicago public schools so that uh, crowded schools in African American communities would somehow remain. Uh, it would, oh, you know, lessen the crowding of schools because now kids had to be go to class in in, in trailer homes. Um, we talked to John Vinci, the architect, who led the fight uh, to save the Garrick Theater. And Helen Schiller, I hope you probably remember her. She was the alderman of Uptown, and she had really interesting perceptions of the pictures that we took in Uptown. Um, I don't know how how many of you remember William Singer, who who ran against Mayor Daley in the 1960s, and we talked to him about Daly and the, at the convention. Uh, and, and then we talked to people in the know, people who could give insight to the pictures. Uh, Tom Palazzolo, a really great filmmaker who has photographed uh, Maxwell Street for decades, commented our pictures on Maxwell Street. Rob Warden, who ran the Center for Wrongful Convictions, talked about uh, a picture from the 1940s of, uh, people, uh, a, a, a wrongfully convicted man who was leaving um, jail downstate, and he was the subject of the Jimmy Stewart movie, uh, Call Northside 777. Um, we talked to Christopher Reed, who's written a wonderful uh, history of African Americans in Chicago about the 1951 Cicero um, race riots. Uh, we talked to two people to help explain Pilsen and the, and the Latino community of South Daring. And uh, we talked to Miles Harvey, who I think you had speak here a few weeks ago. And he talked about the impact of the expressways on the city when they were built. Um, and then we talked to writers that we really admire who have written really beautifully about Chicago. Tom Dija, who wrote a book called The Third Coast, uh, told us about what Chicago was like in World War II. And uh, Carol Marine, who I think you guys all know, uh, she recalled the day that JFK died and what, what it was like. And finally, well, almost finally, we, we, we used excerpts. Sometimes we couldn't find the right person for that event. Uh, and there was just beautiful excerpts that we have about three or four excerpts. Uh, Tim Black, who just passed away, uh, wrote about being black during World War II. And uh, Mamie Till Mobley wrote about the death of her son, Emmett Till, who's, I think she's, she's actually on the cover of the book. But we used an excerpt from her book, Death of Innocence. And uh, finally, um, we, we used a beautiful memoir, an excerpt from a memoir by Michelle McBride, who wrote The Fire That Won't, Will Not Die about the uh, Our Lady of the Angels fire in the late 1950s, which was a big uh, traumatic moment in Chicago history. And, uh, and finally, we talked to some young reporters, young journalists, about events that happened long ago that they could reflect on. Um, we have a picture in the book, I don't think it's on the slideshow, of George Wallace in a ticker tape parade going down State Street in 1968 when he was um, running for president. And the picture was fairly shocking to, to me that, that, that there was such support for him. And uh, Deborah Douglas is an African-American journalist, and she wrote, uh, for white society, this photo evokes the question, is this your king? And interestingly, I, I, I wasn't, I was, I never really asked her this question. I should have, whether she was using the word king as a 
monarch or as a reference to Martin Luther King. Uh, and finally, Manny Ramos, uh, who is the grandson of Manny Ramos, who was a Latino leader in the 1960s. He also was assassinated in 1969, a very important event. And he wrote about his grandfather. And, uh, and he wrote, in a lot of ways, you're the reason I'm a journalist, because I realize the power of words. And so to me, this book is really this combination of words and pictures, something that I've always been innately interested in. Uh, Walker Evans, the great photographer, said that if my pictures, if he said that his pictures don't need words. He said if, if, if they needed words, he'd be a writer. And um, there are people who believe that pictures can stand alone, and I don't doubt it. Uh, some pictures can, but I think that oftentimes the combination of words and pictures really create a new object. And uh, I guess that's my journalism background. I, I wrote captions, and I remember taking the L downtown from Skokie to, to work, and I would see that everybody was would read headlines of the papers, and then they read the look at the picture, and then they look at the caption, and then they turn the page. Well, I wrote the captions, and I always thought that I was the best read writer in the Sun Times, even though <laughs> I'm sure Mike Royko would not agree. So let's. I, I've chosen 15 photographs, um, and uh, I'd like to talk to you about each one. And I think these photographs are both, well, some of them are surprising, I hope. They were surprises to us. And some of them um, are just classics. It's hard for a picture editor to, to turn down a classic and let the classic not join the book. So let's see, let's go to the first slide. Great, great. So this picture um, was, was a wonderful surprise. It's, it's a picture of the Illinois Reserve Militia returning uh, walking down Michigan Avenue in, on, in honor of returning black veterans at the uh, end of World War II. And unfortunately, uh, I think that white society has always portrayed the battlefront in World War II as a white battlefront. And, and so uh, this shows my naivete, but this picture both uh, surprised me and I thought it was just beautiful. It was taken in 1945, right? It was actually taken on August 11th, which I think may have been the day of the second bomb, the Nagasaki bombing, but it was right in that month where it was very clear that that uh, that the Allies were going to win the war. So, okay, let's go to the next picture. So, yeah, this is our cover picture. And um, the Sun-Times, if there were five pictures that, uh, that I would say were the most important pictures they took, uh, I would say this is one of them. This is Mamie Till grieving for her son Emmett after uh, Emmett had, Emmett's body had been returned back to Chicago in 1955. And I think you all know the story, that she decided that uh, there was going to be an open casket so the world could see what her son looked like. I'm really proud to say that the Sun-Times covered the funeral of Emmett Till remarkably well, both photographically and word-wise. I think we were there every day. There were overflowing crowds. Uh, uh, the Tribune hardly mentioned it. Um, and um, it makes me feel good that, 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 that you know, I, I had no idea really how a major metropolitan newspaper, mostly white newspaper, would have covered that. And they, they found it very important from the very beginning. And so that makes me feel good. Okay, let's take a look at the next one. So this is an unusual picture. Uh, women are lined up after following a prostitution raid on 64 East Walton. And uh, this was taken in 1953. And I like the picture because, uh, well, I like the picture because of the, the one of the great things about journalism is, is access. And you get to be, go to places that you, 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 no one else is allowed to go to. Um, it's funny, I remember uh, there used to be what we called perp walks, perpetrator walks. And when the police would arrest somebody that they thought had done a particularly heinous crime, uh, they would walk him or her, it was usually a him, uh, from police station to police station so the press could photograph them. And uh, it says something about, about mankind because I remember our page one editor uh, waiting to see the picture of the person. And I remember one night he said, and he was a very smart person, he looked at the picture and says, yeah, he did it. 
<laughs> like, you know, we make such snap judgments, such visual, you know, snap judgments based on visuality um, that I was both disappointed in him, but, uh, but I kind of agreed with him. He, he did look like a real bad guy. And, um, uh, and I realized the, the power that we have for visual acuity, not just the acuity that we find in our uh, eye doctor's office, but we do make all these judgments based on what we see and what we see in print. And of course, they're not all correct, but, but, um, but on the whole, I think that we've been given an ability for good and bad to be geared towards what we see. And uh, that's, that's one of the things I learned at the sometimes. Okay, let's go to the next one. Can someone, someone? Okay, so this is the funeral of the Our Lady of the Angels uh, fire. Uh, this was a shocking moment in Chicago history. 90, uh, 95 people died, 100 people were injured, and um, it all happened within, it was the afternoon of school, and fire broke out in the school, and I'd say within an hour later, they were just bringing out uh, the bodies of mo most of the were, were, were uh, young elementary school students, but there were nuns, and and um, I think it was shocking. Uh, if you did, anyone go to Catholic schools? If you did, I think that was certainly part of. I know my wife did, and and she, everyone talked about it for many many years. It was something that uh, made schools much safer, but made people just more aware and uh, of the fragility of life. So let's go to the next one. So this is a uh, this is a beautiful classic picture. Um, it's uh, uh, nine firefighters were killed in 1961 after a wall collapsed in a warehouse on the uh, near west side, and uh, we had Carl Smith, who you've probably heard of, a historian who wrote the great about the Great Chicago Fire. He worked for Northwestern University, and this is an example of he told us kind of the significance of fire. In Chicago and how it defined us, obviously, and how fire is less and less of a um, threat to uh, to us individually and, and as kind of a society, uh, but that it always is ready to rear its head in something like this. So, okay, let's go to the next one. So I mentioned Rosie Simpson, who um, who actually was an organizer of one of the protests of mobile homes in. Uh, uh, in Chicago, mobile homes, as I mentioned, were used to to basically get around the idea of segregating schools. That they that there was enough room in the African American schools because they had these extra classrooms, and people uh, fought hard to protest against it. And I think this picture is really an important one because. I look at the what was done to this man, and well, I don't have to tell you this. I think you guys have all figured this picture out. And you look at the the faces of the police officers, and 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 you see that they're having such a good time doing this, and it's so inhumane um, that I think it's a, a very important picture years later. I would say some of these pictures in the book made the newspaper, and some of them didn't because we had a chance to go back to the negatives and you know look at them with new, new eyes. Okay. So let's go to the next one. Oh, that, okay, that's not the one I thought. Okay, the, this I think is probably the most important picture that the Sun Times ever took. It's Martin Luther King at the start of a rally in Market Park for open housing, and actually, uh, so as as the rally started, he was pelted by stones by people in the neighborhood, and the picture is a little bit confusing because you see this white man over Martin Luther King. And um, and, there, and he's actually protecting him. He was a uh, he was a bodyguard of King's. Uh, he was a union bodyguard that was uh, asked to help. Uh, they 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 knew how, what a dangerous situation was, and so that's him kind of protecting him from other rock throwing. And after that day, uh, King said that he had been all over the South in his career, but he'd never seen the hatred and violence that he saw in Chicago. So it's. Uh, it makes you pause, obviously, to figure out how far we've gotten. Uh, I, th I think we have made great, great um, strides, but, but I think we have a long way to go. So, okay, let's go to the next one. 
So this is a picture by Dwayne Hall, who I mentioned before. And this is at the, uh, it's not the start of the Democratic Con National Convention, but obviously it's, it's in progress. And it was taken on Michigan Avenue. And, uh, you know, you talk about, I, I talked about pictures and words, talking about words as captions, but sometimes pictures actually uh, are part of a picture. And I think it, it really makes this picture uh, so poignant. Okay, let's go to the next one. Are we, are, am I going too fast or are we, are we okay? Okay. So this is actually the picture. I, I forgot that I put in here. The picture, I, I love it when people are giving me slideshows and they're surprised at the next slide. <laughs> Whoa, I didn't know I left that in. Uh, but this picture I think is also really important. It's uh, George Wallace waving to Loop supporters in 1968 uh, during his run for president. And um, uh, he, he actually, uh, got 46 electoral votes uh, in the 1968 election. And uh, it is sobering to see, uh, I would not have guessed that he had such support in Illinois and certainly Chicago. Uh, this looks like one of these astronaut scenes going down, down street. And uh, it was a pleasure to work with Deborah Douglas and in her interpretation of what she saw in this picture. So let's go to the next one. I'm sorry. Okay, so this is the L crash. Uh, does anyone remember this? This was uh, evening L, four car L, the turning the corner at uh, Wabash and Lake Street. And uh, one of the cars actually fell to the ground and the other cars, uh, well, it was a mess. And actually this picture is a little hard to interpret because there is, there is, a, there is a car hanging and then there's a, actually a car on the ground. And uh, I did track down a man from Wilmette. He's still very much alive. And he, um, he wrote an account that night. He went home. He was kind of a train buff. It's a really fun account because he talks about, you know, the electromagnetic uh, connections. And it was, it, was, it was way over my head. But there was a lot of humanity in the midst of it. And what he felt as he saw this, he, literally, he, he went to the mailbox and he mailed a letter and he said, had he not walked those 10 feet to the mailbox, he would have been actually crushed by one of the trains. And he stayed until the police got there and it was very, very difficult to extricate people from this crash. And uh, uh, for anyone who's my age or older, whenever they take the L around that curve, when they've actually put a kind of a steel barricade up, uh, we think about that crash. So, okay, so let's go to the next photograph. Uh, this was a great moment in Chicago photo, photo history. Uh, Jane Byrne and her, her husband, Jane McMullen, um, took an apartment in Cabrini Green, and uh, they spent a month there. And they wanted to prove to everybody that life, life wasn't that difficult. And uh, they were pretty ostracized during that time by the residents who wanted nothing to do with them. And uh, it was a fantastic publicity stunt that kind of failed, but uh, the documentation of them sitting at the table, I think, is, is the picture we're using. Uh, I love, I, I guess they brought in the, uh, the little break front of dishes and stuff like that. So it's, it's one of my favorites. Okay, let's go to the next one. Uh, anyone, can anyone tell what this is? You guys are youngsters. It's Comiskey, it's Disco Demolition Night. So uh, if you remember, Steve Dwall was a young disc jockey at the time, and he hated disco music. And so between a doubleheader, he torched uh, disco vinyl LPs. And, uh, and it, was like, it was like his own little fireworks show. And they didn't expect it to be popular, but there were 20, 30,000 people who it was a sold out ball game and thousands of people were waiting outside and they broke the gates down and they ended up rushing into the ballpark and the, the Sox forfeited the second game to the Indians. And um, it's very memorable to me because it's the only baseball game my mother ever went to. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that, you know, if you only go to see one thing in life, that becomes the norm. And so she really believed that at the end of every game, there was a riot in the middle of the field and you watched it and, uh, uh, and, and and then you go home. So it was, it was quite a night. And uh, Jack Lanahan sometimes was in the middle of the field when he took that picture. Okay, so let's go to uh, the next one, which is just a wonderful moment. 
because it's just like this incredibly regular swearing in ceremony. It's the swearing. In, well, it's, it certainly wasn't a regular swearing in because Harold Washington was sworn in as being the first African American mayor of Chicago. And uh, you can see Jane Byrne, the former mayor, and her expression as she looked up at the at Washington. And this was one picture that absolutely was in the newspaper, and it was actually played correctly. And it was really this wonderful picture. You can't say. You can't write enough about transitions to, to portray what happened in this one second. So, okay, let's go then. I've got two more to go. So I don't have to really tell you much about this picture. You remember it? I assume you were all there. Were you? Everyone now says they're there. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, very special night for Chicago. Um, Obama's greeting people in Grand Park. And uh, he said the famous words, this is our moment. Uh, I'm, I, I'm not sure how long that moment lasted, looking back historically, but um, but certainly, uh, uh, I said there were no celebrations in this book. This is, I guess, the closest we come to a celebration. We think that's a really important picture. And then we'll go to the last picture, and I can take questions. So the book goes all the way up to 19, uh, to 2020, and it, it, it shows the, just the, um, all the disturbances across Chicago in 2020 after the George Floyd shooting. And we also have this pretty spectacular picture of a, of a COVID nurse. Uh, Ashley Rezin, who's the photographer, took it in April of 2020. So it was just, COVID was just about a month old. Do we say things are old? I don't know. Um, and at that time, it was, you know, it was, it was pretty courageous that she went into the hospital and spent an entire day following a nurse. Obviously, it was even more courageous if you were the nurse, but uh, but we all respected that she was able to do that. I, I think it's hard to even remember how scared we were and the idea of going into a hospital and getting scrubs on and spending a day there. She, she explained to me the whole process at the time when she was finished of taking off her her scrubs and literally throwing them out because she didn't want them coming into the house and changing clothes on the, on the door of her house. But uh, I think that this is a beautiful picture. It's a nurse who literally has just spent the last moments with a patient who died in front of her. And she's reflecting for a moment as she goes to another patient in the hospital. And uh, I think it really uh, dramatically, you know, that's the joy of photojournalism, how in one sixtieth of a second, it can have meaning to us all. Um, you know, I can't, I can't tell you how my life, and I'm going to assume a lot of your lives, has been based on what I see. I mean, I wait every day for pictures from the Ukraine so I can better understand what was going on. Um, I see the Vietnam War as the, the famous shooting in Saigon of the, uh, by the Saigon police chief. Um, obviously, the civil rights, you know, both the still images and the moving images of Selma and the fire hoses. Um, I think journalism, uh, photojournalists have always taken a back seat to journalists uh, for many years. Like when we looked at these pictures from the 40s, they're not even credited. Um, not, you know, they weren't even good enough to get their names in a, in, in a newspaper. So um, I, I, I believe that, that uh, photojournalism is, uh, is a driver uh, as you as you view the world, and as you look through newspapers or online, and uh, it's just been a pleasure to be a, a part of it for all these years. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Excellent, really outstanding. Um, you really, this book is fantastic. Uh, you couldn't look at this book and not be stirred. I would recommend everybody pick up a copy. I'm not just selling books here. I, I really feel that way. I looked through it myself yesterday, spent a few hours. Outstanding book. Thanks. Uh, before we go to Q&A, we are going to have a musical interlude, as is our custom. Um, so uh, during the Q&A, I mentioned that you, if you are online streaming, you can put questions into the chat, um, you know, anything you want. And we'll come back to that after our three or four minute break here. And then in person, we also have a microphone set up. Uh, so anyone who wants to ask questions here, we'll try to alternate or see how it goes um, in our in our hybrid hybrid model. And uh, during the, the, inter the musical interlude, please contribute to the Ethical Humanist Society of Chicago. 
Um, it's your contributions. Here we're asking for money. Any amount is helpful. Um, we appreciate um, any, anything you can do. We also want you to come and join us and contribute in any other ways that you can. We are welcome all that, but right now log in. If you're here in person, you can scan a QR code. There's some baskets. Um, if you wanna use your phone, you can do the QR code. There's a basket for cash and online, there's some instructions on the chat. So we will be back in just a few minutes. Thanks. in the auditorium, please come up to the mic. And if you want to post them online, they will be sent to me on my phone. Um, at, they're going to go through our crack crew that is um, doing the AV and the screening of the questions. And then I'll read them to Rich. Thanks. Katie. Thanks so much. This is such an interesting talk. Um, and I've been in Chicago for 30 years, so I'm a transplant, so I couldn't say yes to all the stuff from the 80s, sorry. Um, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Sherman Dilla Thomas, the sort of, uh, he's a sort of almost, he's an up and rising historian, black historian, who was um, singled out um, by the reader as sort of the, the best new sort of Instagram, like social media presence. And okay. as a black man growing up in Chicago, he has kind of- Thank you use picture like he's sort of showing me the city right. through a lens that's new to me right. and i was thinking so much about what i see through him and your comment that what you guys picked is different like when you go back and revisit it and i wonder if you can reflect there's sort of these meta questions of like whatever even got photographed and of the potential photographs which ones got picked and printed both physically printed and then in the newspaper printed right and who's making those decisions when and how you got to revisit some of them, but you will never be able to get the picture of the disabled guy in 1945 who couldn't use the L or whatever the heck thing, right. you know? Right. So can you think of, tell a little bit about those decisions, those existential questions and the filtering and how that shifts over time? Uh, I think so. I, I, I'll give it a try. First off, I should say that um, you mentioned the internet and, and I think that there's never been a time when photos were more important because, you know, try saying something on Facebook without a photograph and see how far you get. 
you know. So we we all realize the importance and power of photographs. Um, as far as going back in time and revisiting, um, you know, lately I actually have a, I have a new job. I'm a kind of a volunteer photographer for the Evanston Roundtable, uh, an online newspaper, and they have a uh, arch rival. The Evanston Now is an arch rival. And I realize that there's many ways to portray where you live. Uh, Evanston now seems to concentrate on uh, police, uh, the police report. And that's, that is all, I, I, I wouldn't doubt that it's all true. Somebody got held up on Howard Street and, and somebody got their computer stolen on Sherman Avenue. Um, and we have a more, I won't say humanistic, but it's, it's, uh, you know, so 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 it it's the same community, but completely different coverage. And both of them are right. It depends on what you as a person want to concentrate on. And so when you look at Chicago and journalism and time, I think you have to realize that the newspapers, the daily newspapers uh, and the local newspapers are just picking one one millionth of life and society. And um, I'd like to say there's a conspiratorial angle to it that, oh, we're only going to pick the bad or we're only going to pick the good. In my years of the Sun-Times, um, it was such an effort to get out the newspaper that I don't think we had time so much to think about what we were doing. Now, 30 years later, you look back and why didn't you cover the African-American community more? Or, uh, I think it's easy to do. I think those are legitimate concerns and not legitimate concerns because really our goal was to um, just get out a newspaper. You know, do we have a front page picture? Do we have a picture on page three? And um, and oftentimes it was the easiest thing to do. It was easier to go to a press conference than to, to than to document the concerns that come out at press conferences. Um, I know there's. I talked to a, uh, a journalist at La Raza, and every day La Raza not every day, but most of their, a lot, a lot of their front page photographs were demonstrations. And then finally, he was a younger journalist. He said, well, why aren't we covering, you know, the lack of housing or the problems of crack cocaine instead of covering the demonstration? Well, demonstrations are a lot easier to cover. And, you know, somebody says no more cocaine and, you know, and so it's all very visual. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is that that I would like to go back and kind of figure out what was behind every picture and every coverage. But the truth of a newspaper is that a lot of it's utilitarian. This is the paper that we're going to get in the morning and we're going to forget about in the afternoon. Uh, and that doesn't make it less important, but it makes it... Um, uh, it's just the, I think the reality of it. it it's interesting to me uh, as somebody who's now very interested in all types of periodicals that I find that the two most important periodicals of our age are both very difficult to find in a library. Uh, anyone have an idea what, what two publications I'm thinking of? Playboy magazine is one. I think that they are essential to understanding the the last half of the 20th century, and Rolling Stone. And both of those were considered, well, Playboy was considered dirty, so librarians didn't want to have it in there. And Rolling Stone was kind of considered alternative, underground, who cares about, you know, Nirvana. And so, uh, you know, we get to be really smart years later. I can be really smart in looking back at all these pictures and figuring out what's important. But at the time, it's a whole different ballgame. So. Did I, I don't know if that answered your question at all, but it sounded good. Yes. Thanks. Um, I was wrestling myself with which daily picture you were going to show, and neither may or made it. Uh, right. I'm guessing you have some in the book, we but I'm, I'm wondering um, if you'd had to pick one from either of those, like which would it have been? I mean, I had several in my mind that maybe they're trite, but. Right. Which ones are you thinking of? Well, there, there was one where he's standing there at the convention looking like a, you know, right. a thug. Right. Like that, um, yeah. Um, and so I I guess you picked a different one for right. that. But there, there must have been many, certainly uh, from the first mayor. 
Well, that's our favorite picture too of the convention. Um, and it was actually in our first couple of books about the Sun Times, and we kind of tried to avoid pictures that were in our first couple of books. But it's a great picture, and I love. It. If I was going to use one daily picture, it would be him uh, at the convention, and Tom Keene, his alderman, is behind him, and they're all sh and, and Richie Daly is behind him, and they're all sh shouting to um, the Connecticut senator, uh, whose name I'm forgetting. Who got up on the podium and said, "You know, this we, we, this shouldn't happen. This what's going on in Chicago shouldn't happen." And they're, you know, really yelling at him. That would be my favorite picture. In this book, we have a picture of the Daly funeral. So it's not a Mayor Daly, but it's of his family on the steps of the Bridgeport Church, watching the coffin come in. So, yes. Um, could you say a little bit about how photos change depending on the cropping? And did you crop any of the ones in the book, please? Yeah. Um, when I was on the uh, paper, I cropped a tremendous amount because in those days, the Daily News, rep uh, the Sun-Times reproduction was very bad. And so we needed every single piece of help we needed to make the pictures pop. So we would crop right to the area that you know we, we wanted. And we actually had a whole team of artists with uh, airbrush material who could airbrush the backgrounds of pictures so that they would pop much better. Um, you know, now that I'm uh, working in books with much better reproduction, I'm kind of interested in all parts of the picture. So I would say that we did very little cropping. There are photographers who don't believe that anyone should crop their pictures. Um, uh, and there are photographers who have depended their whole life on cropping pictures. We're, we, we don't have any great philosophical we try to show pictures as, as completely as they can. So interestingly, we did a book. We've done two books on Vivian Meyer, and I'm sure you're all aware of who she is, the, the nanny photographer. And uh, we didn't crop a thing in, in her, in, with her pictures. Um, and I'd like to say that it was because we, um, we were trying to be respectful of somebody who had died. And I, I think that was part of our decision. But the truth was, she had an amazing eye and she cropped herself as she she took pictures and it was just thrilling to see how she did it. Um, but th then there's, uh, I put her, the, the, when, I, when I rank photographers, uh, I put her at the very top with Dorothea Lang and Dorothea Lang was a cropper. She, uh, she cropped a lot of her pictures. And so, uh, you know, I, I think the best way to approach picture editing is to not have any rules if a picture will look much better as cropped, I think it's fine. And if not, I would say try to leave it as it is. So always always an interesting moment, a decision. Yes. So I think in your book, you may have mentioned my, my husband had the book and he was pointing out that there were dozens of photographers at yeah. one point at the Sun Times. Well, there is were that... there were dozens, there were 24 in the war years. But in my years, there was usually between 12 and 15. Right. And I would say there's now about four, five. Yeah. You may remember, I think it was back in like 2013, the yes, Sun Times laid off. The absolutely. They laid off entire, their entire photo. The entire staff. Right. They became the first country and uh, first newspaper in the, in the country to lay off their entire staff, which included John H. White, who was a beloved and incredible Pulitzer Prize winning photographer. It didn't matter who you were, you were laid off. Yeah. Um, so that I, was, I'm just interested in that hearing what is the future for a news photographer if you had a kid who said oh i'd love to do this right. would you be able to actually recommend for any young person to think they could do this for a living or or does it just mean it has it just changed are you just an independent photographer who tries to make a living piecemeal selling your photos. Well, I would say financially, I would discourage my son or daughter to become a photographer. But I would say as a person, I would encourage them because just imagine to yourself that you wake up in the morning and your, your, your goal is to take a picture that represents what it was like to live in Chicago yesterday. I mean, can there be any better job in the world? So I would probably recommend the job, but uh, it probably wouldn't be the best decision. So, but I think people that are photographers and most of my friends who are sometimes no longer have jobs, but I don't think they would give up the years that they had to have literally, literally the front row of history. I know it sounds like a trite phrase, but uh, a photographer would, would be sitting in the front row here 
And I used to always say that when photographers would take a picture of somebody, they would walk into somebody's house, say they were a, uh, maybe it's a business story about the CEO of XYZ Corporation, and they'd be given 10 minutes to photograph because the CEO is so busy that they can't afford more than 10 minutes. And uh, inevitably that photographer at the Sun Times would come in and take the very best picture of that person that has ever taken. So the skills that photographers bring, the clicking of the shutter is just the, the end result. It's the driving to the scene. It's the walking through the crowd. It's the getting up front. It's the being in position. And then the click of the shutter is just, it's, it's all done before you actually click the shutter. And so, but that's not to take away from their photographic skills. But, but interestingly, um, I've been around photography for a long, long time. And there are people who really know cameras and who really know lenses and who really know exposures and they don't take good pictures. And then there are photojournalists who have absolutely no idea. I have a friend of mine who hated flash. He just never could, he never could really master flash. So he would just kind of ask people to move over to the window. He took beautiful pictures. So it's, it's really like everything else. It's in the heart. It's an art that's in the heart and not in the brain so much in my opinion. Yes. I have a, <laughs> I have a fondness for black and white photography. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just wondering, like at, at the UIC archives, how many imprints would be in color? Like, for example, if you went into the archive, would Disco Demolition also be in color? Because what um, you showed was black and white. Right. Um, I think we showed photos the way they were taken. Um, we made a shift from black and white to color really in the late 90s, right near the end of my years at the Sun-Times, um, everything was taken, almost, almost everything was taken in black and white. Uh, in fact, color was always very, um, very awkward because photographers were used to shooting in black and white. So they would literally go out and they take pictures of sailboats with red sails. And, you know, it was just so obvious that it was in, uh, very, not very interesting. Um, I love black and white too. I think um, uh, I think there's a whole group of people. Uh, raise your hand if you just love black and white. I'm assuming almost everyone's going to raise their hand. You didn't raise your hand, <laughs> uh, and you're on the on the fence. Um, but um, but there's a beauty. There's a simplicity when you take things in black and white. You're looking at form rather than color, and uh, you can't replace it. But but generally in our book, uh, we our last section is about two thousand and beyond. And everything it sometimes was taken in color around 2000. So things changed dramatically there. Now, obviously, everything is taken with um, uh, digital cameras. And uh, the editing process has become even harder because for every 100 pictures that you take of an event that we talked about, there's probably 500 pictures because it's just, why not? Just click the shutter. I think it's to be hard. So uh, Rick here off camera and asking some of the online questions. Sure. I have a few um, and, but please step up and you can step in. Uh, we probably have 10 minutes or so Great. more time. So first question is, do you worry that photos, video that go viral on social media do not speak for themselves, but trigger reactions and judgments that fit into the narratives rather than reflect reality? Well, it depends how philosophical you want to get on that question, because I will tell you, that photography is real. And I will also tell you that photography is not real. Life is not based on a one by one inch framed section of the world. Um, photography has uh, cameras view the world very differently than we view the world. If I take a picture right now with a camera, I'll take a look at it and it'll be very different from what I'm seeing, from what I'm seeing here. So I think that photographs are like words. They can be used in a realistic manner and they can convey reality uh, or they can be used to convey fiction. And, uh, but, but I think we value photography because we put trust in the reality of, uh, of what a picture represents. And um, of course it represents you know, uh, you, w the pictures from the Ukraine right now, we could look at them all and we can see the same pictures. We can see courage and determination and standing up to uh, uh, the, the enemy. 
and people in Russia could see the same, the opposite. They could see the, a pitiful, uh, a pitiful band of people who are going to be crushed. You know, same photograph, and they would, they would, it would, it would convey. I don't know if everyone in Russia would feel that way, but I know one man in Russia would feel that way. Uh, so, you know, I think pictures have lots of reality. I, I love the fact that you can put pictures online and everybody can have completely different interpretations of it. I think that's kind of the value of it. So one more from online and then we'll go to here in the room. Uh, it's interesting that you said that Evanston now is your arch rival. As an Evanstonian myself, I think I benefit by having two newspapers that do appear to have a different beat perspective. What is your view? I, I agree. I agree with you. I think uh, uh, even though it's not my cup of tea, um, I think that newspapers are so important. Uh, I was uh, talking to a man recently who was talking to me about corruption in a, a governmental institution in Evanston. I won't name who, what institution it was. And he was just bemoaning the fact that he didn't feel like there was any serious journalist in Evanston that could take on his worries and concerns. Uh, you know, I, I think I'm probably preaching to the choir. Uh, I like choirs. When I say I, I can't emphasize the importance of journalism in a free society. And um, uh, interestingly, I read in the New York Times yesterday that Putin is closing some of uh, Russia's free presses. And I, my, my feeling was I didn't know there were any free presses in Russia. Uh, we can't exist as a society without really good journalism. Uh, so going back to the question of would I encourage somebody to become a journalist, a photojournalist, I don't think that there's, I don't think it's the most important job in America, but I don't think there's any jobs that are more important. So I would encourage you. Um, reflecting on the Sun-Times, this is not quite about, well, it, um, the latest uh, ownership change at the Sun-Times, mm -hmm. and especially given that it's a radio, I'm wondering if you think that affects how it will um, invest in or use photos specifically, or if it matters not at all. Uh, the Sun-Times has a chance, you probably all know that the Sun-Times was recently acquired by Chicago Public Media and is now a nonprofit. And uh, uh, a group of Chicago philanthropies have pledged $60 million for the Sun-Times and for WBEZ and to support that. So obviously the Sun-Times has a chance to remake itself. In fact, if it doesn't remake itself, it's probably not worth the $60 million that's going into it. Um, and I think it's an incredibly important time for the Sun-Times, for Chicago journalism. Uh, uh, I don't hate the Alden Tribune as much as I thought I would, uh, but I don't, I don't see any, I don't see them, I don't see what their end game is. Um, it just is a newspaper. And, uh, and it's a newspaper that's based on profits. And so to me, um, it, uh, it's, it's, it's starting, you know, I, I'll, I'll look at it and read it, but, but I don't, you know, I think there's problems with it. And the fact that Chicago has a chance to have a major metropolitan newspaper that's a not-profit, oh my gosh, it's so exciting. I know a lot of people have given up on this sometimes. They feel like it is a kind of sleazy tabloid over the years. I think they're wrong. Um, I start my day every day with the Sun-Times and the New York Times. And uh, you can't find a better sports section in the world. I don't even watch sports, but I don't have to even worry about it because the sports section is so good that it, it brings me back to all the teams and all the sports. And I think the Sun-Times itself has, has shown an incredible, like the Ukrainian freedom fighters, an incredible resistance to stay in the business. Starting in the early 90s, we talked about the Sun-Times closing, and that's almost 30 years ago. That's a long time for a company to hang in there. And they've always been able to hang in there. And uh, frankly, if I had one message for you, I would hope that you all give the Sun Times a, a chance because I think it's going to be very exciting. Okay. So let me add uh, two questions. Really, they're very similar. So I'm going to go ahead and read them both. Sure. Um, or sort of two perspectives. So the first one reads: Some years ago, the Sun Times laid off all its photographers, as was mentioned, and depended on photos sent by members of the public. Where does the paper get its photos now? And before you answer that, the related question is, on internet, and it says, in quotes, internet news, like Yahoo, we see many canned pictures from some archive or another. Can you comment on tapping into archives of these photos? Archives of abuse? Uh, archives of these photos. So I think the question is saying um, that 
when we're looking at the internet, and I'll read it again, um, the internet news like uh, Yahoo use canned pictures from an archive. Right. And can you comment on tapping into those archives um, to use them in the newspaper, I guess the daily right. paper, or as news? And likewise, where do the pictures come from now? Because, and it was kind of harking back to there was a period, I guess there was no photographers, which I'm not really clear on, on that. Right. But, uh, maybe I shouldn't have combined them two, but right. I, I can't even remember the first question. So the first one. Let, let, let me let you talk about the second, then we'll <laughs> go back to the first. So as far as the first, the second question, using archives online, I think it just points to the power, the importance of photography. You know, we can't go back. Photog you know, everyone as a child learns about time machines and how there's a place that can transport us up and back or back in time, and we think that it's like the coolest thing in the world. I'm sorry to sound so naive, but I think that's what newspaper, I think that's what pictures do. I think it gives us a chance to, within seconds, within a click of the button, go be transformed back into time. So I think it's wonderful that that archives are being used left and right uh, to, you know, it's usually, you know, where are they now, the stars of the 40s, but but it doesn't matter. I mean, it, it, what, what matters is that we have a chance to go back and and uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really not interested in reading the New Yorker from 1940s, although I'm sure there was great material there, but I am really interested in looking at the New York Times archive of the 40s. So I, I think it, again, harkens back to how important photography is. And I'm sorry, the second, the first one. Part of the question too is not just about archives, but where do the pictures come from now? If, well, can people just send in pictures to the newspaper and they'll appear? I think that's what they were getting at. Where do they come from now? And, and what happened during that period when they laid off all the photographers? Or right, was right. Was a period where they had Well, in that, in that period, they, they thought that reporters could take pictures as well as photographers if they were just cadding in their, their iPhones. And um, and I don't think they were wrong. The iPhones get blamed for that, but it's it's not the iPhones phones that was a problem. It's just very hard. You know, journalism is a incredibly rigorous pursuit if you're doing it right and every move you make you're using your own judgment where should i who should i interview where should i interview them how should i portray them as a photographer and um i think we don't realize what goes it all seems so simple i i don't think that serious papers should use photographs taken by the public. Um, number one, the quality is always disappointing. If you ever watch the Channel 5 or Channel 9 news and they send in the weather photo and it's, oh my God, come on. You know, it's uh, uh, icicles on a tree or something like that. I don't know what the problem is. But, um, but to take real photojournalism to really portray life, um, I, I don't think you need a PhD in journalism, but I think you need you need an organization that has standards and expectations and you live by those expectations and you learn by those expectations. And like a doctor or a shoe repairman, you get better and better every year. And I don't think you can compare somebody who's been doing that for years in a serious way to someone who just goes out with their camera and takes a picture. So I think it's good to depend on actual photojournalists. And the, the time, and we do address in the book, uh, 2013, when the Sun Times got rid of photographers, and it really is a dark day in in all photojournalism history. Yes. Thank you for this really uh, moving presentation. Thank you. Um, I apologize if this is too much of a question, or I don't even know what my question really is. But I've always been fascinated. Those are by... my favorite questions. Great. <laughs> I've always been fascinated by the ethics of the moment of taking a photo and of being a a witness instead of a participant right. Um, right. and lots of other things like that. And I just wanted you to reflect on that as we close. Um, do you have any examples or just thoughts about the morality of I, photography? I do. I, I think it's more about the physicality of photography. And I hope I get this right. I've, I've, I heard this once. It's probably... That, that what's magical about pictures is that you're taking something in the present of the past, which will be viewed in the future. You know, that moment you click the shutter, it's about the past. And no one will see the picture until the future. That's pretty heady stuff. And, uh, and it's, uh, and it, and it, and it, you know, I mean, the ethical humanist, uh, uh, location and, and it makes you think about life and, and uh, how, 
how wonderful this whole media is and how responsible you have to be in portraying that. Because um, in the wrong hands, I, I guess there are no wrong hands or right hands, but in, in people that are not as, as responsible as they should have be, uh, it can convey a picture of the world that just isn't, um, I won't say it's not accurate, it's accurate, but um, I think truth is so much more than accuracy. So I would say that it may, might not be truthful to the future or to even the present. And um, I think my answer is as vague as your question. <laughs> <laughs> you say you still start your morning every day with the Sun-Times. Is it print or is it online? Print. It's print. Okay, so <laughs> my question is the relationship between the photographs and the reader print versus online and how has that sort of relationship changed as um, we've changed the way we consume the news? Um, it's changing so rapidly and I'm such an old fossil um, because now, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm photographing for the Evanston Roundtable and I, I literally submit one picture of every event. And I realize why aren't I submitting 10 pictures? It's not taking up any more room. It's not taking up any, you know, like, like, they're used, they used to always call the front page real, real estate and that you're taking up too much real estate with this photograph or this article, whatever it is. And now that doesn't exist. And, and the whole idea of time, like, like when I take pictures for the round table, I wait till three o'clock to send it in thinking that the round table is going to come out that next morning. And of course, at 301, when I drop the picture, it's out in the world and, the, and, and it's not day by day. It's just a continuation. So it's a whole new look at life of, of journalism and that there's not, you know, we're done with today's issue and now we're going on tomorrow's issue. No, we're done with the 301 p.m. issue of the New York Times and now we're going to the 302 p.m. issue of the New York Times. And um, I think it's exciting. I think for old fossils like me, it's a little exhausting and perplexing, but, uh, you know, the possibilities are, are thrilling. So we have a few more online questions, but sure. I do apologize. This is going to have to be the last question. We're just running out of time. So maybe this is uh, straightforward or not. Do you prefer film or digital photography? Oh, oh. oh that's an easy one. What am I going to say? Film. Digital. Digital. Oh. <laughs> um, digital is so easy. It's so um, instantaneous. It's so beautiful. Uh, I have an Apple 13 mega Maxa camera with three lenses and um, and I get to events and people don't take me seriously because I'm not taking out the long camera. Um, but it, even the camera itself is wonderful because instead of having the long camera between you and I, I now have this little box that I can kind of put down here and, and record what's going on. And uh, it really connects me more to people and the results are wonderful and there's no film and the day that our film technicians left the lab was the great celebration in their life. They were so tired of chemicals and fumes and, uh, you know, working so hard to get a roll of film out and then they had to print it. Oh, digital is, is the world to me. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. I apologize we couldn't get to all of the questions. There's clearly more interest in where is journalism going in the newspapers. There were some uh, left questions online about that. Um, certainly more to come and we hope to revisit. Appreciate having you here. Thank you very much. Um, taken from the famous speech where Daniel Burnham says, make no little plans, he goes on to say, and I prefer this line, but it's not often said, make big plans. Aim high in hope and work. Thank you.